Good evening, everyone. It's 6.30, so I should start. Um, we had over 90 um, this afternoon. Uh, so that wasn't a bad turnout, uh, a little less tonight. Um, I think I'm supposed to say, after I say welcome, glad you're here, um, you might want to silence your phones uh, this afternoon. I did not say that, and a number of phones kind of went off during the session. So if you can at least put them on vibrate, that's a little helpful. Um, again, thank you for coming. It's, it's been quite some time since we've had a, a general meeting of the parish. The purpose is to give kind of a state of the parish report. Dealing with COVID and its consequences these past 15 months has certainly been an unprecedented endeavor. Now that things are moving toward normalcy, it's, it's a good I idea and a good time to, to bring parishioners up to date. So, um, so my plan is kind of to talk about a number of different areas just to um, say what's been happening and uh, to kind of point to the future. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about COVID and the par parish response to that. We're gonna talk about properties. We're gonna talk about mass attendance, um, the latest info from the diocese on what we can do. Um, Matt will give a report on faith formation. Um, Paula Smith gave me a report for the Holy Family School. I'll just briefly mention um, some good things like that have been happening at the Adoration Chapel and our food pantry. Uh, we'll talk about briefly just about diocesan lawsuits, just so you're up to date on that. And, and then the uh, big piece is, is finances and kind of where we stand, both as the parish and, and Holy Family School. Uh, above all, we remain a community of faith. And whatever we do, we try to keep in mind that we are baptized into Christ Jesus. Our baptismal call is to love God, to love one another, and to serve God and to serve one another. So we gather as a community of faith, and we usually begin with a sense of prayer. So let us just pause for a moment and realize that we are people of faith. That's what draws us together. That's why we are community. And it's this, this God that we believe in who is with us through it all. Creator God, we've been through some difficult times. COVID has interrupted so many aspects of daily living. We've experienced many trials, among them loss of loved ones, resulting in continued grief. The virus continues to manifest itself in many parts of the world, and certainly there is a, a fear for the future. We felt a sense of helplessness through all this, but we know that you remain with us through it all. As we plan for the future of our parish community, we ask that you send your grace into our hearts so that we may act out of trust in you and faith in you. We pray all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, in unity with the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. I think it was the day before St. Patrick's Day, 2020, that we received word from the diocese that all public masses were to cease. We were in the middle of the Lenten portion of the Lent Easter Pentecost season. The mandate meant that we couldn't gather. We couldn't celebrate the events of Holy Week as a community. It just all seemed so strange. And initially, many of us thought, well, this will last some weeks, maybe a couple of months. There were very few cases in our own area at the time, and we hoped for a quick return to normal daily life. But of course, that didn't happen. So the question arose, how can we as a parish continue to provide for the spiritual needs of our members? Now, not many of us on staff are techies. But it became clear that our best bet was to use technology to remain connected to parishioners. So someone said, you know, you can use your phones to live stream. So we figured out how to do that. 
so we could live stream Sunday Mass as well as daily Masses. And we tried to do so from St. Patrick's Church and from St. Mary's Church. And if anyone tuned in to those particular Masses, uh, while the picture quality was pretty good, the sound was just terrible. The churches were too cavernous, and the echo made it extremely, made it extremely difficult to make out the words. So we decided, okay, that, that's not working well. So what can we do? Well, then we got the idea that we could use the chapel here at St. Mary's Rectory in the basement. And Father Rick created a, a small chapel at St. Pat's. We were able to broadcast daily Mass and Sunday Mass from a more enclosed space, eliminating that annoying echo. People could understand the words. And that worked pretty well. Although internet difficulties occasionally interrupted the live stream. As the pandemic continued, the suggestion was made to look into getting a camera in one of the churches that could plug into the sound system, eliminating that echo. So we met with the head of the Syracuse-based DCI. They had put in some of the sound systems in some of our churches here in Elmira. Yes, they could provide something, although the cost was around seventeen to eighteen thousand dollars for for one camera for one unit then we thought well we're using two churches what about possibility of two cameras they gave us a small price break but the total came to at least thirty five thousand or more so how are we going to pay for that well that's when we turned to parishioners we explained what we wanted to do and you were amazingly generous. Um, I think we collected over $40,000, which paid for the two cameras as well as some of the incidentals, and there are ongoing costs. So it, it was through your generosity that we were able to do that. We were very pleased because we could go back to church because the sound through the sound system eliminated that echo. And uh, Matt Rory is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the cameras when he talks about faith formation. In July of 2020, we were able to resume public masses, although we did need to follow COVID guidelines, such as masks, social distancing. We couldn't have hymnals, we couldn't sing, at least the assembly couldn't sing. There were no choirs, no lectors, no altar servers, no extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. We had to have people register and sign in at mass so we could do contact tracing if needed. We had to sanitize after every mass. So we were compliant with the social distancing guidelines, and people began to come back. Well, small numbers, of course, at first, increasing a little bit in time. Of course, we had no funerals for a number of months. We had no weddings. We couldn't visit hospitals or nursing homes. We couldn't have in-person parish meetings. The only time I could go to the hospital was when someone was actively dying. Some cases were COVID, and I had to gown up with a with protective gear, leaving whatever I used to anoint in the room as I left. We did learn to meet over computer using Zoom or one of Zoom's cousins. Now we're certainly very grateful that people continued to, to support the parish financially. But of course, income was down. Not as much as I expected, to tell you the truth, but still it was down. But we did have to reduce some staff due to finances as well as the fact that our workload had lessened. We furloughed Arlene Sikonoffi and Kelly Randall. Arlene was one of our liturg liturgists who worked with many of our liturgical ministers. Kelly worked in the office. Our pastor associate, Deacon Joe Irway, Irway was furloughed for a time. When some ministry needs resurfaced, we were able to bring him back. The Faith Formation Office has changed. Sister Sue decided to relocate back to her mother house in Connecticut, and Aaron Lindgren, who headed up the confirmation program in youth ministry, was also furloughed. We actually have not renewed Aaron's particular position. What we did was to hire Matt Murray, who actually is kind of working with both positions. And as I mentioned, he'll be giving a report on what's happening with that faith formation program shortly. We also had to furlough three of our organists as we haven't needed them with any regularity. And Paul Holland, one of our choir directors, because we had no choirs. 
We will take a look at staffing as we open up more and more, although finances will indeed be a factor moving forward. There's been a change in the finance office. The diocese has asked us to participate in a shared service model, and Suzanne Krebs will be leading that effort. She's begun getting, getting familiar with our parish. Dave Quinn has indicated he will retire in September, at which time Suzanne will be our finance director. And she'll give a report about our current state of finances. She's worked hard with all of the numbers. Attendance at Mass has slowly been increasing. Social distancing has been relaxed, at least for those who've been vaccinated. We do continue to ask everyone to wear masks for the safety of all, since not all have been vaccinated. Now that may change in the near future if the new re relaxed guidelines don't increase the number of COVID cases. Uh, we just wanna take a cautious approach first. And we're very proud to be able to say that we've had no COVID cases traced back to us. And I'm grateful to all of you for being very careful. The staff will actually meet tomorrow to discuss how best to implement some changes as a result of the relaxed rulings regarding COVID. I think most of you are aware that we have property issues. In its heyday, Elmira had nine Catholic parishes. Some of you no doubt remember that. Each parish had its own campus and at least two priests in residence. I think Father Rick mentioned that when he came to Elmira in 1987, there were about 25 priests serving the Elmira area. When I came back to Elmira in 2010, Elmira had three parishes with six worship sites and three active priests. And while we've always been grateful for the help of senior priests, we just had three active priests and a lot of property included in our six sites. When COVID interrupted life as we knew it, we were in the process of negotiating the sale of St. Charles, which had been relegated by the bishop a few years earlier. When the church was relegated, we did so because we thought we had a buyer. But in the end, they offered less than 25% of our initial asking price. They reasoned that they would subtract their, their renovation costs from our asking price and pay us the remainder, in effect, asking us to pay for their renovations. We said no. When the group that ultimately brought, bought it came forward, unfortunately, prices to sell churches had dropped significantly. The appraisals were much lower than they were even a few years earlier. But the group was willing and able to pay what the appraisals suggested. And it all happened pretty quickly, even in the midst of COVID. We really had hoped to have a final liturgy there and celebrate what St. Charles had meant to people over the years. But COVID prevented that from happening. And of course, there remains a sense of loss among many within our community. No one likes to see their church closed or sold to another group. For many, it's a time of grief, like losing an old friend. Sentimentally, we'd like to keep all our churches. People still grieve the loss of St. John's and St. Cecilia's and St. Anthony's. But we all know that loss and grieving are part of every human life. Each one of us knows joy and sadness, blessings and disappointments. The good feelings are great. The bad feelings, not so good. But truthfully, only in heaven will we have only good feelings. We've got to wait for that. We did sell the rectory at Our Lady of Lourdes also, but we still have a lot of property, more than we need. Now, we do have some rental properties. There's the house on St. Casimir's property and the house on St. Patrick's property. There's the house next to St. Charles, which I believe will be sold in the not-too-distant future. Also, Habitat for Humanity rents space at the old St. Peter and Paul's convent, and Catholic Charities rents the community kitchen at uh, St. Peter and Paul's Community Center. On to um, mass attendance numbers. Beginning with the first week of July, or with the first week of June, we've been able to reduce some social distancing, allowing for more people at each mass. When we had to social distance, 
the maximum number we could fit into our largest churches was around 140, depending on family situations. Of course, the same household could all sit together. Now we can probably accommodate 200 or more, still providing some social distancing areas. And I have to say, this weekend, it was really great to see more people at Mass. Now, now the numbers, even though they've been so much better, are still far short of an average weekend when we had a seven-mass schedule. I think our average then was over 1,000 each Sunday and Saturday evening. I'm just going to give you some of the numbers that we've dealt with since Christmas. Christmas, we had seven Masses. The number of people that attended those seven Masses... 474. That weekend, Holy Family was 163 at four Masses. Mary Mother of God, the Holy Day, was 158 at three Masses. And Epiphany at four Masses was 229. Then as we got into January, totals were pretty much the same those four weekends. Uh, We had 278, 251, 287, 281. Then Ash Wednesday, they went up a bit. People love Ash Wednesday. There were 355 people at the three masses on Ash Wednesday, more than we find on the weekend. And then once Lent came, numbers did go up a little bit. We had 309, 311, 308, 308, 384. The 384 was Palm Sunday, another day people like to come. And then for Easter, we had five masses and 624 people. Since then, we've averaged weekends 358, 388, 371, 383, 436, that was Mother's Day, extra people come on Mother's to please their mothers, Um, 200, Ascension Thursday, 405, 456, 509, 553, and this past weekend, 703. That's a big jump, that's great. Um, We know we may need to add another Mass, um, so we'll be looking at that as staff but it's great to see more people in in church. As you know, uh, about a week ago, um, the government said that we could be open a lot more. Um, And the diocese has issued a similar kind of statement, although they're they're a little cautious about some things. Um, We we can't have holy water. Um, We can't uh, use the cup at mass for communion, uh, probably anytime soon. they still discourage the sign of peace, uh, or it's done without touching. Now, that's what you already do now, so we'll just continue to do as we have. And some social distancing seating is still recommended at this point. Uh, things like music, choirs, singing, that's all on the threshold. And, and we will talk about that as staff, how to implement some of those in the very near future. One other thing to mention before I I introduce Matt. Um, While while having the cameras has been really good, we know a number of people don't have computers, and so the camera didn't really help them. One of the things that we did do to stay in touch with people um, was we would send them the bulletin. So um, I think Annie used to, I don't remember the numbers, but I want to say maybe at one point she was sending out 30 bulletins to Homebound. Um, Well, it went up to like 187 um, because People who didn't have any other way to connect asked her to send them bulletins. So we were able to keep in touch that way also. So we've tried a lot of methods just to kind of keep people abreast of things if, if they choose to, to want to be kept informed. So anyway, Matt? Good evening. Um, Just to introduce myself, um, I'm Matt Murray. Uh, I've been the Faith Formation Director here at the parish for the past nine months. I, before joining the parish, I was uh, a missionary for 11 years, and when COVID hit, we weren't allowed to travel as much and and do those things and so I contacted Father Scott to see if there was anything at the parish that was available and we um, there was and uh, we both 
agreed that this would be a good fit. And so I have been working in faith formation and leading that program since September last year. And I've also worked pretty closely with Father Scott and DCI to implement the new camera system. Uh, to give uh, a little background on what we did last year for faith formation, we had 160 religious education students. 14 students were confirmed this April. 20 students completed their first penance in December of last year. 28 students completed their first communion in May of this year. And we saw over 70% of all of our students complete all 25 lessons in religious education courses. Uh, all of our uh, religious education and sacramental prep courses were done online, 100% online, except for uh, receiving sacraments this year. And so we, it was really encouraging to see how, how well they all participated and uh, completed all of their, their assignments. Moving forward into next year, we are planning to be meeting again in person uh, with potential of doing some hybrid courses with online and in person. Our focus is really to be, uh, to put an emphasis on parish-wide faith formation and creating more of a family and parish-wide program uh, so we can all grow in our faith together. Um, we will continue to have traditional Sunday school courses as well, but we want to put an emphasis on our family program. We will continue to have uh, traditional sessions for sacramental preparation. We have already seen some good interest for our RCIC and RCIA programs, and we will continue to keep you updated uh, in the coming weeks and months as we get a clearer picture of what faith, faith formation will look like next year. Uh, to transition now to talk about our the camera sy system that we were able to put in at St. Patrick's and St. Mary's, uh, as Father Scott had mentioned earlier, we were able to raise over $40,000 to fully fund both camera systems plus all of their uh, peripheral equipment as well as to fund the licenses for uh, the streaming service and the uh, music licenses. Uh, with the new cameras, we have been able to see exponential increase in our overall quality of both video and audio for our masses and special events. We have doubled our average viewers for each mass. Before we put in the cameras, we were seeing around 200 average viewers, and now we're seeing between four and 500. And that is just individual devices. We're not exactly sure how many people are actually watching that. And so we suspect that we're reaching at least a thousand, if not more people through our online streaming of masses and special events. We have been able to stream weddings, funerals, first communions, holy hours, rosaries, novenas, school events, and even more, um, we're recording right now and we'll be posting uh, this town hall meeting later this week. Uh, and our plan is to continue to use these cameras to reach out to our parish and to the community. We see it as a uh, outreach ministry that we are able to provide to, to the parish, to those that are homebound and to those that are uh, looking to return to uh, parish life. And yeah, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for welcoming me, me into the parish and I look forward to the year to come and the growth that we'll see.
Matt was not hired to do cameras. That's not part of his job description. But he's only 30, and he knows technical stuff, and the rest of us don't. So it's been great. We've been very pleased with that. Uh, we've even had um, some views of our, our services in other countries. So uh, it's pretty wide-reaching. It's, it's pretty interesting. How many of you had Catholic education? Most of you. Me, me too. Um, we have a school, of course, Holy Family. And so uh, I asked Paula Smith, the principal, uh, to kind of give me a, a report uh, to share with you. Uh, she would have been here um, if I had given her probably more lead time and if it wasn't the last week of school and they had a lot of extra stuff going on. Anyway, um, so l let me share what, what she wrote. Uh, she said, this, this was certainly a challenging year, but the staff, parents, and students worked together to make it a, a, a very good year. It was a year of creative problem solving, adapting to daily chances, changes with a lot of hopefulness and prayer. The enrollment, uh, due to social distancing in classrooms and throughout the building, uh, they actually started the year with a, a waiting list in most of the classes. Uh, I mean, that doesn't happen very often in Catholic education, unfortunately, because of the social distancing. So they, they ended up with 127 students. Um, Presently, there are 111 enrolled for the 2021-2022 for the school year. Uh, the majority of, of preschool students actually end up not uh, registering until sometime in the summer. So we do expect that number to go up a little bit. Um, and of course, they haven't been able to, to give tours or have open house or anything, which is what they've done in the past. Um, so they're, they're hoping that they can do that this coming year. COVID, of course, um, changed how they do things. Uh, classrooms were set up with students six feet apart. They wore masks. There were barriers with each, on each desk for additional protection. Um, they took daily temperatures, system checks. Symptom checks were, were daily. Uh, sanitation was constant, extremely well done by our custodial staff. We had one seven-week closure that was countywide. The only positive cases were while students were out of school within families. So they never had to quarantine a particular class, classroom because of a positive case or exposure. Uh, there were a number of students that had to quarantine due to, out, to exposure outside of the school. And so any student who displayed symptoms, cough, runny nose, headache, stomach ache, they were sent home. And they remained in quarantine for 10 days or until a negative test was received. And parents were amazing. They were incredibly understanding and supportive, always doing what was asked. There were meetings twice a week with the county health department. Daily reports were submitted to the state. Now they opened the year with five full days of in-person learning. Other schools around us I don't think had that. Uh, parents had a, had a choice to keep students home and have them taught virtually. Every teacher had several virtual students to teach daily along with in-person teaching. Teachers prepared weekly packets to go home to virtual students. And we started with about 30 virtual students altogether. And that would change daily depending on if, if someone was exposed. If a student was quarantined, the teacher immediately got them set up virtually. After April break, there were only 10 virtual students. The rest had come back. And as of this last week of school, there are two virtual students. The rest have come back. Uh, during the seven-week closure, teachers came to school and they taught remotely a full student day. And that included the preschool, it included art and music, technology, and gym, physical education. Through several technology grants, they were able to provide each student with a computing device to take home. Now, they also had some religious opportunities. Um, so we didn't do it right in the beginning, but after a while we were able to have masses. In fact, the first Tuesday of the month, uh, we streamed a virtual mass to the whole school so they would watch in their classroom. And then the third and fourth Tuesdays, uh, the third Tuesday, the third and fifth grades came in person, and the fourth, the fourth and sixth grades came in person. Um, uh, the teachers found creative ways within the classroom to to expose them to Stations of the Cross during Lent. A summer project had been to bring back the school chapel, and that they were able to do. And it, it turned out to be just a nice, quiet place where students and staff could find a little calm amid the stress of, of the pandemic. 
Academically, students showed some significant academic growth. Uh, they use a tool called iReady to assess math and reading growth, and that's used in all of our diocesan schools. When they began in September in math, 74% were above or approaching grade level. So 26% needed some help. So Academic Intervention Services, AIS, was used by 26% for math. In June, 95% were above or approaching the regular grade level, and only 5% needed AIS. It was similar in, in English language arts. Uh, in September, 77% were above. Uh, in June, 92%. And so those that needed the IAS went from 23% to 8%. So they're very happy that even amidst this, this COVID and this virtual learning for that seven week period, uh, that there was improvement with the students. They were also able to do some special events, not like they would normally do, uh, but parent-teacher conferences were held via Zoom. Uh, the third grade students did hold their, their saints fair with Parents had to make a reservation to come, and, and you stood on a little line, and, and then the student would tell you about the saint that they were. Although, although I had one student who um, I think was supposed to be um, Saint Gabriel, um, but it was a different saint than Angel Gabriel, but he mixed them up. And so <laughs> the story told part of the story of the angel and part of the saint. <laughs> but he did his research. That was, it was cute. Um, grade six had an ancient cultures fair. Um, they were able to do race for education that they do every year. That's a fundraiser. And they had Grandparents Day in May. Field day last week and graduation is scheduled in church here on Thursday. And that will be live streamed. Fundraising took a hit. They couldn't do some of the big things that they normally did, but they did some small things and raised about $11,000. Um, the annual appeal that's coordinated by Joe Kosmicki did, did very well in spite of the pandemic. Uh, as of June 18th, uh, he had brought in almost $70,000 for the annual appeal. Um, and the Deborah Adams Fund, which I think has scholarships for those that uh, need a little help, um, raised five extra thousand dollars, they're up to about 67,000. And plans are, are in place already for the next year to uh, do a little bit more fundraising. They're hoping to get up to 30,000 this coming year. Uh, they were fortunate to continue to receive a number of federal grants this year. Each consists of an application process and most require an application to each district in which the students live. As the federal money is allocated to districts, and we're then able to, then they allocate their share by district. So because we have um, students at Holy Family from a number of different districts, there was a lot more paperwork than you might expect in, in some local schools, but they did that. And uh, it was able to pay for a number of, of things that happened. It paid for some uh, professional development for the staff. It paid for some of the software, some of the computers, the technology related things, um, some classroom resources. And, and even, even some money for COVID-related expenses. All told, I think with the grants, uh, they were able to raise, if I added it correctly, um, about 70,000 with grants. So um, it took a lot of work, but the, it was well worth it. Um, plans for 2021-2022, um, I had asked the question, are, are they working with St. Mary Mother and Horseheads or All Saints in, in Corning? And uh, they will share Jessica Rutledge as a, a music person. She's going to be working in all three schools. My hope is that maybe they can connect a little bit more with some of the other um, positions that aren't full time but could be shared. Um, they also, the diocese is providing a program called Caring School Community. It has to do with social emotional learning. Uh, um, and so that became part of the program this year. Um, it, it's because of course, because of the pandemic, students and, and adults um, were experience, experiencing some extra stress and anxiety. Um, so it helped alleviate some of that. They're hoping that marketing and fundraising will um, be a little bit better this coming year when we're able to do a little bit more. And, and finally, she, she wrote that she wants to uh, indicate 
her staff appreciation, so I'll read this. The entire staff of Holy Family School has done an outstanding job this year. Each and every day presented a new challenge. Teachers managed a classroom full of in-person students and simultaneously included virtual students in everything going on. That's extra work. Pre-K teachers met the challenge of keeping three and four-year-old students in masks. Not an easy thing. The office staff handled, ex handled the extra recording, keeping, reporting, contact tracing, temperature taking. Custodians worked nonstop, sanitizing everything that was touched numerous times a day. The staff put students and families first, and at the same time were dealing with their own personal challenges, taking care of their own families, maintaining homes, coping with not seeing their families, facing serious health issues, losses of loved ones. But the staff really put in a, a super job. A lot of stress, anxiety, exhaustion, even fear, but they soldiered on. They, they did a great job, and, and uh, Paula said she was, felt very privileged being able to work with them this year. So we're hoping uh, that will continue in the coming years so that Catholic education will be available for our, our children. On to another note, uh, our Adoration Chapel. One of the casualties of COVID was the need to close our perpetual Adoration Chapel. For well over 25 years, parishioners have prayed before the Blessed Sacrament. Closed only during the Triduum and for bad weather, the Adoration Chapel has been a comfort to many over the years. Because of its small space and pandemic concerns, we had to close the doors for over a year. Knowing how important adoration is to some people, what we did was offer adoration in our churches at different times during the week. It was easy to social distance in the churches, much larger space. And, and not a, a great ton of people came, but, but a number of parishioners did take advantage of the opportunity to come and pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Now that the chapel's open again, uh, due, due to the efforts of Rosemary McLaughlin and some other parishioners, um, we don't need to keep the churches open for that anymore. And it's not perpetual adoration, um, it's not 24 hours, but it's 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. each day. And Rosemary always welcomes new adorers. If you're interested in giving an hour, call the office and they'll put you in touch with Rose. The food pantry. Under the direction of Mary Beth Proctel, did not close during COVID-19. Some pantries did. During no normal times, our pantry would serve people from the old convent parish office of Saints Peter and Paul. The back of the building and basement were used for food pantry. At the beginning of COVID, however, due to social distancing requirements, uh, they tried to serve people outside, although a lot of people didn't realize that, and so they didn't come. That got difficult when the weather got bad, of course. And what happened was um, they moved across the street and began to use the gym in the parish center. And that worked out really well. It was, no longer, it was no longer necessary to move the food from storage in the basement to ground level. It was all on one level. They had the cold and frozen storage in the same building, and most of the people could just drive up. They prepared boxes and brought them out, put them in the car. Unfortunately, the clients who walked did get cold in the cooler months, but during bad weather, they were waited on first. And the gym also gave us much, much more space. We weren't able to leave donations in the churches, of course, during COVID, but some parishioners did drop off donations to the pantry on Tuesdays or at the, food, at the parish office. They kept us going during a time when it was difficult to purchase food even from the food bank. They also worked with the free community kitchen in ways that they could. They piggybacked on, on the community kitchen, piggybacked on the food order so they could get deliveries more often. And the pantry was held during hours that the free community kitchen was open and serving lunch so that those in need could get a lunch and also pick up groceries at the same time. This year of COVID, they served over 5,000 individuals and were able to keep the cost at a very low price because more grants and donations became available as COVID progressed. So in those first months, they were serving between two and 300 people, and then it jumped up 300, uh, even up to 500 for September, October, and December. Uh, but all told, in a year's time, uh, roughly a year's time, two weeks being closed because of snow, uh, they served 5,140 people. And the cost to the parish, um, $601. That's, that's pretty good. 
onto a, um, an unresolved issue is the Dowsett's and bankruptcy sexual abuse lawsuits. We still don't know the outcome of them. It's been at a standstill for some time, although there's, there may be some movement soon. I think the diocese is suggesting an amount, some of which will come from insurance companies, uh, but probably not all, which means that the parishes may be liable for some payment. Initially, the thought was that since the parishes are separately incorporated from the diocese, the parishes would be safeguarded. But apparently, a judge ruled differently, and parishes have been named in the lawsuit. So we may end up having to pay some. We have absolutely no idea what that payment might be at this time. Um, but we're hoping that things are moving so that we can have this resolved sooner rather than later. It's been a long time. And the final point is, is um, the finance office. As I mentioned, uh, Dave Quinn is retiring in September. Suzanne Krebs, Krebs will be our, our new shared finance director. So, uh, Suzanne? This is on. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> um, my name is Suzanne Krebs. I have been actually a finance director for uh, six and a half years. I am a, a finance director in the Southern Tier. So my parishes range from Hornell to Owego, and I have all the parishes in between. I'm now going to be doing Elmira. Um, in, in addition to that, they have asked me to um, they have asked me to do a shared service center in the Southern Tier. And what that means is all of the parishes individually right now, they do all their own, their own accounting functions, meaning payroll, accounts payable, accounts receivable, bank reconciliations. They do all that out in all the separate parishes. We're gonna bring that into one shared service center. Actually, the shared service center will be located in Corning, New York. It'll have three to four people that will be doing all of those functions for all the parishes. Um, so it'll be eventually cost effective to all the parishes because it'll all be done um, centrally with more efficiency. Um, so I'm doing that as well. <laughs> um, I've, like I said, I've been here for six and a half years. I moved here from the Buffalo area um, about seven years ago. My husband got a job in the area and moved me here. So um, I just want to go over the financials right now. I do have some financial highlights for you. Um, the first thing I want to go over would be your CMA. Um, the CMA goal for this year, and I think it's been the same for the last couple years, was 202598 You did receive in pledges 152725 and that's with 598 donors. Your shortfall was 49699 and as you know, or you may not know, I'm not sure, um, whatever shortfall you do have, the parish has to pay for out of its savings. Um, so normally you would have to pay the 49699 uh, the, the diocese did give you a grant of $24,699, bringing your shortfall that the parish has to pay down to $25,000, which was awesome. Um, the next thing I want to just kind of I, show you is the regular collections, and this is a five-year uh, trend, uh, the first year being 2017-18. And at that time, your collections uh, for the, all, the par all the churches, all the parishes at the time, were, was $1,590,000. Um, this next current, the current budget, which is the, will be starting July 1st, we're budgeting uh, $1,205,000. That's a drop of $385,000 in five years. Um, it's, it's significant, but I will tell you that all, the par all my parishes in the Southern Tier have um, drops in collections. I will say I've been doing the budgets for six and a half years now, and I don't think I've increased collections at all in any of those parishes in any of those years. It's just been the trend to go down. Um, next would be operating expenses. Again, the same five-year trend. 2017-18, um, your operating expenses were a million eight forty-four, uh, budgeting a million five hundred six. It is down a little, it, down about 330,000. Uh, about half of that, 140, 150,000 is in salary and benefits. Um, some of it's in um, insurance, as you don't have as many buildings as you had. And then some, in some ministries and programs um, decline in some of the expenses that we have there. Uh, 
Uh, th this is actually showing a five-year trend of the parish. This is the parish, not, in the, not including the school, of net operating loss. You can see five years ago you had a net, net operating loss of almost 10,000. The last couple years, 133 this past year, and we're budgeting 151,000 deficit next year. And I did the same trend for the school. And five years ago, they had almost $60,000. They had a couple of really um, significant years, 145000 125000 um, Next year, a budgeting of $69,000 loss. And that is with 118 students. They had 111 um, registered. We put in a few more, thinking they're going to get more in the summer. Uh, but that's also down from 127 students this year. Uh, the next I just want to kind of go over some of the building projects. We had um, Hunt Engineers as well as Ari Kelly and Willett Hauser come in. Um, Hunt Engineers, a general contract ar architectural firm, they came in and looked at all of the parishes, all the churches. They predominantly looked at the churches and they looked at all structural issues, things like that, roofs, uh, ceilings, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we also had um, Ari Kelly, they concentrate in masonry work, all your brick work, um, which is very, very costly, um, as well as Willett Hauser, they concentrate on stained glass windows. So we had um, these folks come in and give their estimates, again, concentrating on the churches. There are some overlap, some parking lot needs. Um, they overlap with some of the parish, other parish needs, like at St. Casimir's. You also have the Faith Formation Center. Um, it's not just the church parking lot, it's also that St. Mary's here, it's not just the church parking lot, it's also the um, center across the street and the school. So you can see St. Casimir's have a, has about a million two um, in estimates that they have. St. Mary's has about 953,000. Our Lady of Lords has 656,000. St. Patrick's almost 738 and St. Peter and Paul, 1156000 for a total of $4,756,000. Uh, and I do have individual by the church, so you can see what some of the um, items are. I will say, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of th the same themes. There's um, masonry work, stained glass work, ceiling repairs. All the churches sort of need some of the same things. Some of them need fire alarm upgrades, lighting upgrades. Um, but here's a list of all of St. Casimir's, masonry, stained glass, ceiling, bathroom renovation, and the million two that I talked about. But each of the churches have kind of the same big ticket items. And again, I just want to make mention, they do have all, we do have a lot here, but not all of it has to be done immediately. There are some safety issues. Some of it can be on a five, you know, seven year plan where we try to fix things each year. But again, some of it are safety issues, but some of it's in a more of a long-term plan. Um, again, St. Mary's has masonry, stained glass, ceiling repair, bathroom renovations, kind of all the same roof repair. And they do have a large parking lot, um, estimate of 479,000. And again, that is not just the church. It's the other um, part of the campus as well. Parking lots are expensive. I came to find out in Corning and All Saints, they had a very expensive $700,000 parking lot. So they're very expensive. Our Lady of Lords Masonry, $120,000. Stained glass, $62,000. And again, their parking lot is $276,000. So there's a big ticket item. Uh, St. Patrick's. Um, masonry work, 201000 Stained glass rest restoration, 210000 um, And the stained glass is very expensive. It's very intricate. And there, it's also, it's very specialized. There's not a lot of people that do it. So it's, it's, it gets very costly. And then last is St. Peter and Paul. And you can see on there, they have stained glass of 420000 And masonry restoration of 400. Those are the biggest. Um, pieces there, roof repair, 112. That's all I have on the financial update. And probably 
screenshot there. So where do we go from here? Unfortunately, our financial picture is not great as we are working with a deficit budget. Never bodes well when our expenses are greater than our income. And we do have some money in investments, so things could be a lot worse. But we really can't go on year after year expending more money than we take in. There are a few ways to balance the budget. One is to increase income in some way. The best way you do that is some sort of increased giving campaign or stewardship drive. Um, we could take a look at that. Um, with COVID, I'm not sure it's the best time to do that, but uh, we may not be able to wait. So we'll, we'll be discussing that. Um, another way is to reduce expenses, uh, to reduce costs to sell property. Um, the other way is to reduce salaries or reduce staff. Uh, provided that we can continue our mission with less personnel. We've already uh, furloughed a number of people um, and may not be able to bring them back. Um, so uh, our hands are kind of tied. We don't have a lot of options here. We'll, we'll discuss some things, but um, uh, it's not an easy situation to be in. Um, so we do need to look at all, all of those things, but we have to keep in mind that as a parish, we need certain things to operate. So we definitely need to have worship space. We definitely need to have office space to conduct business. We definitely need to have faith formation class space. And we need gathering space for parish events. You know, we haven't had parish events during COVID, but as things come back to normal, that's gonna happen. And those community events are important. Um, now we know we have an abundance of worship space, five churches. We all know we don't need five. Uh, at the last Finance Council meeting, the committee recommended that we relegate two of the five churches. Um, first was, was Our Lady of Lourdes. Um, th that actually kind of came about because there is someone who's expressed an interest in, in that property, both in the convent and in the church. So you can't sell a church until it's been relegated. So that came up at the meeting, and then someone at the meeting said, we, we have five, you know. I, and we really need to get, I think the diocese really wants us to go to one campus at some point. Um, that's not gonna happen quickly. Who knows if it'll happen. Um, but they said, well, we probably need to do more than one. So why not relegate another church? And uh, they talked about it, they looked at the financials and, and they suggested um, St. Peter Paul's would be the other church that we would try to relegate. So the following week I brought that to parish council and the parish council members discussed that and they agreed with finance council that we would like to move forward with the relegation process for those two, two churches. Now what is relegation? Uh, the term is used in church law for when a church building will no longer be used for Catholic liturgical worship. Once a property has been relegated, any remaining sacred items are removed and the building can be sold for use in an appropriate and dignified manner. Now, the relegation of the church must be attentive to three things. First, the church can be given over to, now this is the church language, over to profane but not sordid use. They both sound bad, don't they? Profane and sordid. Um, but what, what they mean is a church can be used for a secular purpose, that's the word profane, but not for a sacrilegious, immoral, or scandalous purpose, that's the sordid. Um, the Presbyteral Council, which is the priest council of the diocese, might be asked whether they believe the faithful would be scandalized by the new purpose of the church building. The demolition of a church building is not considered a sordid use. Second, the good of souls must be provided for. The Presbyteral Council might be asked whether they believe the faithful will be adequately nourished from the spiritual goods of the church after the parish church is relegated. If the number of faithful is very small, or other Catholic churches are available at a reasonable distance, then the good of souls may be adequately cared for. And the third one, which doesn't really quite apply, I don't believe, but I'll tell you what it says. Any persons who can claim legitimate rights must give their consent. Now, this circumstance is likely to be rare, it says. However, a religious order may have a specific long-standing tie to a parish church 
and may have acquired a right to use the church. Or a donor may have given land or facilities while reserving certain rights regarding the use of those donations. So the presbyter or council needs to be informed about the consent of any person or group with a legitimate right. Parishioners and other donors who give their support to a parish church, even for many years, do not automatically require any right to direct the use of those donations unless they have expressly stated their intention when making the donation. In general, the bishop consults with the presbyteral council before making a decision. If the bishop decides to proceed, he issues a decree relegating the church to profane use. The decree should make note of the consultation with the presbyteral council and the reasons for relegating the parish. By this decree, the church is no longer considered a sacred space and cannot be used regularly for divine worship. The decree should also indicate that the building may not be used for sordid purposes, such as some work that is immoral or contrary to the faith. Then it does go on to talk about treatment of the furnishings of the church. So uh, we'll have a, a checklist. In fact, uh, some of you um, probably know Mike Tamara, um, who was an architect who lived many years in, in Elmira. He's now down in New Jersey. Um, but he knew, knows all of our churches in Elmira very well. And, and he wrote up a, a proposal kind of saying, um, if you relegate any of our five churches, he listed all the things that we should take note of, that we should, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, or do this, do this, do this. And he's very thorough. So I'm grateful to have that. It's kind of an inventory of things we should look at for any of the five churches, should we decide to relegate any of the five. He's also going to send a part two. And the part two um, will kind of help us um, see where um, some of the religious furnishings uh, might be sold if we want, if we choose to do that. Uh, um, there are places, uh, I guess, that deal with that, with church goods like that. And, and I think Mike's doing some research on that. So, um, for example, uh, the altar. Um, we have a lot of altars in Elmira. We don't need them all. So we might be able to sell that to a church that's, that is looking for a new altar. So, um, but again, this is, this is down the line. Relegation is not a quick process. Um, it takes a while. Uh, but once it's relegated, it can be put up for sale. Not, you can't officially put it up for sale until it's relegated. So we need to prepare for the future. I think I'm still considered one of the younger priests in the diocese, and I've been ordained 37 years. In the not-too-distant future, we won't have two full-time priests. And if income trends continue, we'll have less money to run the parish, especially if we have all these buildings that we really don't need. So should we move forward with the relegation, we do want to have final masses in those churches, recalling the history of the church and the many celebrations which have added to our lives especially sacramental celebrations. Now, none of this is easy. The loss, of course, is a very sad reality. Grieving is part of what happens. We grieve as individuals, but we also grieve as a community of faith. We know intellectually that our faith is not dependent on a building, but emotionally it hurts. We've all experienced losses in life, and we know how challenging that is. Some losses we never get over. But we do move past because God gives us the necessary graces. I do want to say how grateful I am to all who have helped us weather the storm of COVID. We know the virus isn't eradicated, but we certainly are in a much better position to begin to resume some normal activities. And yeah, we struggle with finances. Both the parish and the school have de deficit budgets. But I think returning to a place where we can begin to discuss how we might address those deficits is, is helpful. Um, so, questions, comments, concerns? Um, it's 7.29, we will end by eight. We can end earlier if you don't have a lot of questions or comments or concerns, um, but we offer you uh, that opportunity. And we're going to ask you to speak into the mic because we're, we're not live streaming this, but we are recording it. Uh, and if you're not speaking to the mic, the people watching the recording won't be able to hear you. On the renovation expenses, 
specifically St. Mary's and St. Patrick's. Does that include renovations to the rectories since they are attached to the churches? Or is it specific to no, the church? No, those are just the church buildings, well, and the parking lots, but just the church buildings. Scott, this refers to Zan. I, I didn't, uh, I just wondered about the, um, the grant from the diocese regarding the uh, CMA. Is that a one-time thing or is that, could that, uh, And when you you said the deficit this year is 151,000, no, I'm talking about the deficit now for the parish. Could you use the mics? Is it? Yeah. So no, but he's talking about two different things. Yeah. I, he has a second question: the deficit, the proposed deficit for the coming year. You said it was 151, Suzanne. 151 for the parish and 69,000 for the... How long can you go on like that? I mean, I mean, realistically... Yeah, it's not... Yeah, no, you can't. You can't go on that long. Um, you can't go on forever like that. And the problem is it's, it's, it's complicated because your collections keep going down. Um, so it just, it's going to just start... It's just going to keep growing. Okay. So we definitely need to address it. Part of it is the buildings... Um, part of it's going to have to be looking at all the other expenses as well. Okay. And if you wouldn't mind going back just for a minute, because I couldn't hear you very well about the grant. They did it last year, two of days that you said, last they, year yeah, and this year? The, the, that was a CMA grant. They gave you $10,000 grant towards your shortage last year, and then they gave you another almost $25,000 this year. And then next year? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Can't predict. Yeah, I can't no. predict, and I don't know. I mean, they, they had some parishes that were over, and their CMA goal, so that's where they got the money to, to help the parishes that were short. And in some parishes were short, and they didn't get any grant. I think it just depended on how, how short you were. I was just surprised they did adjust some of those goals, and I know a parish in Rochester, they went down 10,000, and they always made their goal. Yeah. We never make our goal hardly, and we only went down $4,000. Yeah, a lot of where, the, where it went down had to do with what they re-looked at all the census, the United States census, and they go by the income in the, in the zip codes of, parish, of parishioners. Now you, and they go by 10 uh, groups of 10. So if there are 10 parishioners in a very, let's just say, in a very wealthy community down in Florida, they'll count that income as well. So it just depends on where people are living and where, that contribute to your, or that are registered as your parish. Okay, thank you. But they redid all of the U.S. census and that's why some of them changed. I would say half of my parishes went up and half of them went down. Okay, thank you. On the collections, I've been tracking it since we opened last July. I see very little fluctuation from week to week. Occasionally, we'll get the number from the draft, which is done twice a month to my understanding. Are our collections showing the draft, or is that specifically what is being taken at the door? I, I didn't get all of that about the collections. You've been tracking them. Twice a month, people who want money donated, taken from their account, and deposited into the churches. Electronic giving, are you talking about? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sometimes we see that number in the bulletins. Most times we don't. So the number that is being reported as the collection of a, every week, is that only what's coming through the doors? And where is the draft money coming from? I believe what happens, whatever is collected on the weekend goes into the bulletin. And then I think, I think it's just once a month that the electronic giving comes through. And so that total is added to one of those four. 
So generally that one week is going to be higher because electronic giving has gone up. We've had more people sign up for it. But um, it, it's included, but I think it's just once a month that the numbers come through to Ann. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Father, um, it seemed like the estimate to renovate Our Lady Lourdes was one of the lowest numbers up there. What determines that you would close that as opposed to one of the other parish uh, churches that is you know, much more costly to renovate? Uh, the initial um, driving force behind that was um, a group that's expressed their interest in buying the church. You know, we could put up another church, but if no one's interested, it doesn't help us. We're still stuck with five. So St. Charles actually was in the best shape of all of our churches, which is why it was appealing to an outside group. Um, it'll be hard to sell a couple of the churches because of the condition of the church. Um, so we could put that up but nobody's ever gonna buy it. So we're still gonna to have to pay insurance for year after year after year. So um, even though that probably is in the best shape of the five churches at the moment, at least by some, uh, it still has some issues, but uh, um, there is an interest in it. Plus, um, it's, it's by itself. Uh, um, it, it, there's, there's no place for faith formation. Uh, um, there's a nice gathering space in the basement, although there's no elevator. Um, so there are a couple of factors that determine what it is. Part of it has to be the interest of people outside. If they're not ever going to be interested in a particular church, then you can put it on the market, but it's going to be there forever. Um, so that means sometimes we have to let go of one that maybe we don't want to, simply because we just can't afford five. Yeah, I was wondering, um, did you qualify and or did you apply for any PP uh, uh, monies? Yes, yes, we did and we did. <laughs> and we did get money, yes. So that, that was helpful during COVID. The school also got some. Father Scott, do you have a sense of the percentage of giving that comes electronically now? I don't. Um, I just know it's gone up via COVID, but I don't know how much. Um, so I, I don't. Have you seen those figures? Okay. Uh, we could fig we could find that out. We just don't know at the moment. Don. Well, you do so be, be, so people can hear you. Father, I just wanted to ask if you have taken advantage of the Community Foundation of Almira that also gives out grants. I'm but sorry, what, what is the group? The Community Foundation of Almira. Community Foundation. Yes. Uh, um, okay. Like for your cameras, for your technical equipment. Uh, I'm asking if that I, No, I, I have not. I, I'm not familiar with the Community Foundation. Okay. Well, I think it's been around here for a long time. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, no one's ever mentioned it to me. Um, it's just something. Well, till now. It's something to think about. Sure. And, and sure. I'm, <clears throat> what I'm about to say, I do not mean for anyone to think that I'm being disrespectful, because I'm not. But I look around here, I look around Lourdes, and if those churches are going to be sold or going to be torn down, whatever the plan is, there is money <clears throat> in all these windows. And I'm sure. hoping that they get refurbished to another building. Yes. No, um, when I mentioned Mike tomorrow, that's one of the things that's in his report, on his checklist, to make sure that we, we check about the windows. Um, 
I think, again, when he sends that second report, I'm expecting that there'll be something in about a company that deals with Windows that we can contact to see if there might be a church who's looking for, for something. So, um, so yes, we're aware of that. He, he's pretty complete, pretty thorough in what he, he writes out. Uh, um, so I, I think we've got a pretty good checklist of things to look at, and that's one of the things on the list, I'm sure. So, yes, thank you. My question, Father, is do you think that once the uh, pandemic is over, will some people never come back to church? And those who have not gone, have they been sending in? Uh, I mean, there's, I think, two schools of thought. One is, well, if I'm not there, I don't have to give. If I'm on vacation, I'm giving someplace else, that same theory. Uh, what, what's your thought on whether people will come back and will they increase their giving? Or did they give, did they give when they weren't coming? There are a number of people that, that continue to give without coming, yes. Um, I mean, I can't see into the future, but, <laughs> but my guess is there will be some people who do not come back. Um, I think some people have gotten used to watching it on TV, <laughs> and that's what they're going to do. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, what can you do? I mean, people are going to make, make their choices. Um, but a number of people who have not been back to church still have contributed. They send in their donations. So, uh, again, it's more than I expected. Um, people have really been very, very generous and very faithful. So, um, you know, it's just that our numbers are, are declining. Um, when uh, Dave Quinn first came, one of the first things he did was to point out that this is 2010, 2011. Um, one of the first things he pointed out was that the biggest givers in all of Elmira at that time were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. <laughs> a lot of them are gone, um, and we don't have young people to replace them. So unless another industry comes into Elmira, um, you know, we're probably looking at continued declines. And so we have to best prepare for that. Is there any uh, indication of a parish festival this year? Uh, it won't be this year. We think it'll be next year. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it does take a lot of work, and um, they usually plan kind of early spring they start. Um, so when they asked, and we were still in the midst of this, we thought, oh, it's probably not going to be a good idea to try to do it so quickly. So we're hoping next year. Um, Don, up here. <laughs> Just a quick question. I, you'd mentioned the, uh, the the folks who were giving the the, the most when uh, back whenever it was 2010 was ten, ten years ago. <laughs> Uh, I'm just wondering, are we constantly updating our, I know, for example, too, for the CMA, it's part of what the de determination is, the number of households within the parish. Are we, uh, is the data showing that we're losing households? Um, I mean, if we're losing households, it makes sense that the, the, the uh, sure. you know. Sure. I, I don't, I know the office tries to keep up with that. So when people move, they remove them, or when new people come in, they, they add them. So they do uh, do that on a regular basis. Um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily 100%. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. leave without telling us. Mm -hmm. They're still on the list. We don't even know they're not there. Uh, um, and some people come in, they come to church, but they don't register. Uh, um, so we can't record what we don't know. But they do try on a regular basis to update that. Okay. And, and just one more. With the shared services model that we have for the finances now, <clears throat> does that mean if we're centralizing things for in, in Corning that, for example, we have people um, <clears throat> over on Davis Street at the Faith Formation Center, are they transitioning to where you are? Are they being furloughed? And the other, somebody raised the issue of, of grants. Is there a person that we have that's a, a grant writer that kind of tries to shake the grant trees a little bit? Um, as far as the um, employees that are in 1010 Davis, they, some, they will be going over to shared services um, and working there full time. The one person will, as you know, Dave will reti be retiring and then um, 
Kathy will be working. Um, she's requested to go part-time, so she'll be changing her schedule. So we're working all of the trans transfers into shared service through the existing uh, business managers that we have. So at this point in time, there will be no, nobody furloughed for that reason. Is, is that across all of the parishes throughout across, this area? Correct, across all the parishes. So right now, so they'll be losing some of their finance, their accounting functions. So what will happen is I'll have a, a business manager that will have more than one parish. So for instance, the person in Hornell will now be responsible for Hornell and Bath. Since she's not doing the accounting anymore, she can now handle some of the operational issues at, two, at more than one parish. So that's kind of, we're kind of restructuring their jobs. Um, they're not losing any hours or anything. They're just going to be doing something different. And out of what budget does their salaries and benefits come from? Pardon me? And from what budget, for example, if they're working here uh -huh. in Elmira, it's coming out of what we budget? Well, is what will happen is the, pers the people that will be moving to shared services will actually, their payroll will go over and they'll be paid for by Corning, because Corning will house the shared service center. And then on a monthly basis, each of the parishes will get billed out for their a portion of the shared service center that uh, for their work that's being done in the shared service center. So the people that were, are no longer working at a parish specific, they're doing shared service, they'll all be moved to Corning and they'll be moved to Corning payroll. And then a portion of their expenses will be divvied up between 11 places because there's eight parishes and three schools. So instead of eight parishes each having their own individual person, it'll be reduced to four for all eight. So there'll be a cost shaving savings for all eight of the parishes. Okay. At some future time, we're going to need to have a parish-wide census. I envision two things. One, an in-person visitation or census. And on a second, a possibility of having online census so that all members of the parish can be canvassed. It, it's always good to update things. Um, a couple comments to that. Um, not everyone's online, but certainly a lot of people are, and that would be helpful. Um, going door to door, I think, Today is a little bit different. People are more hesitant because of violence, because of, of the, the climate is just not friendly. Um, I wouldn't want to send out parishioners to some areas only because it could be dangerous. Uh, um, so we just need, I mean, it doesn't mean we can't make some effort in that area, but I just want to be a little careful about that. You know, 20 years ago, it felt different. It just doesn't feel as safe now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Father Scott, with uh, the real estate market being what it is now, a seller's market, wouldn't it be prudent for us as a parish to get ahead of that and start listing some of these properties? Um, I mean, there are bidding wars going on right now for houses around the area, and they're well. Well, the one, the one house uh, um, we are going to list for sale, the one next to St. Charles, okay. uh, it's empty right now. Um, so we are going to list that. Um, of course, we can't list churches until they're relegated. Well, and, and that was my next question: is that it, it was my understanding that, like your College of Medicine, had expressed a sincere interest in St. Patrick's to turn it into a dentistry school. And it's my understanding they've got pretty deep pockets. So that would be something. Well, I've, I've kind of heard that also. <laughs> um, we'll have to see where that goes. But um, in talking to Dr. Terry, I, I think he's, and this was a couple years ago, but I, I think he knows that we might be interested. I think he would approach us if they get to that point. Okay. At least we have a dialogue. I just want a little clarification on this. Um, when you're talking about people going to Corning, 
will there still be someone at the Faith Formation Center, if I want to go in and get a mass or that sort of thing, will there be someone in the business office? Yeah, there will be somebody in the business office for sure. Yep. Oh, all right. I wasn't sure. Uh, yeah. And there'll be someone in the regular office. In the regular office too, yeah. Now the office might, the office hours might change, but there'll be somebody in the business office. Anyone else? Father Scott, I imagine that there'll probably be multiple repairs, like multiple parking lots that's on the t that are on the table. So there, there might be a reduced cost due to the volume of, of services. Who, who would be negotiating in, the, in light of that to see if uh, the, the vendor could uh, lower the cost? Uh, ultimately, it would be the um, operations manager, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, they would take over kind of the building stuff. So, um, and I think Kathy will be only part-time, and so yeah. somebody in Corning. Yeah, K Kathy Warner. From Kathy Corning Warner. Um, so that individual would kind of negotiate those sorts of things. Actually, Kathy Warner's in the back if she wants to stand up and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, so you have one assignment, apparently, <laughs> before you start. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned something about um, when you were talking about the, the sorted, no, profane but not sorted. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned something at one point about demolition and I can't remember what you said exactly uh, what it what the document says uh, Ken law says uh, demolition is not considered sorted okay so it can be done uh, yes I mean I mean if a okay. if somebody wanted the land and, and they wanted to put something else on it they could tear down the church that would not be considered a sorted purpose okay thank you Eight minutes. We can finish eight minutes early. That's perfectly fine. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions and your comments. Um, they're certainly helpful, and I think there'll be opportunities in the future to uh, continue to brainstorm some of these things about how we might handle. Um, but it, it's it's a big job, and it's certainly not easy when it involves churches at all. Um, so we're in this together though. Um, so I appreciate your continued support, your presence here. Um, and if any other ideas occur to you, pass them along. We really appreciate it. Thank you.